Paxi. Uh, he's from Carleton mm -hmm. University in Canada. Um, and uh, he's been a, a long time collaborator uh, with uh, some of us uh, in the center. Okay, thank you, Nimal, for, for, for coming and for uh, you know, making time in such a busy agenda as we are. <laughs> thank you very much. And uh, as uh, Munia mentioned, that uh, uh, I'm not going to talk about the uh, proteins and DNA, so uh, it's going to be uh, focusing <laughs> on uh, different types of uh, problems. Um, I'm from uh, Carlton University, and uh, um, it's a great pleasure to uh, come to uh, uh, Unicamp that uh, I have been uh, collaborating for a long time. And uh, since the uh, beginning of CEPID, I had the pleasure of actually uh, working with... Uh, with uh, I'm, I'm okay, actually. I... Uh, we just need a microphone. Oh, okay. There's no speaker, it's just a microphone. We are recording the talks, so we're trying to sell. Is this okay? Huh? So, uh, for the last, I think, uh, three years or four years, I have had the pleasure of uh, attending this symposium every year. So, uh, so thank you very much, and. Uh, um, I'm from Carlton University and uh, this is actually uh, work done by my PhD student Nuan uh, who actually uh, completed about two weeks ago and uh, uh, this work is supported by uh, the Canadian Natural Science and Engineering Research Council uh, that funds uh, our research. So I'm going to talk about basically uh, the behavior of graphene in terms of uh, applications related to mechanical engineering, uh, materials engineering and so on and try to study the behavior of uh, the mechanical behavior of graphene under different conditions. So this is uh, nothing new, you all know about this uh, sort of, you know, a simple representation, uh, but the focus of our work is mostly focused on, uh, on the uh, behavior of graphene and application to uh, different material systems. So in terms of graphene, we all know that, uh, you know, they have a fairly uh, superior strength compared to uh, uh, most other materials. Uh, it's very um, uh, stretchable elastically. Uh, in terms of uh, weight, it's also very attractive uh, for various applications related to uh, materials engineering and also in terms of uh, thermal conductivity and then also about the possibility of uh, functionalization in, uh, in different applications. Now, in, in recent years, actually, people have uh, added graphene into the production of uh, composite materials, right? and uh, what are called nanocomposites. And, uh, and then, you know, like, uh, these are materials that are frankly not available on a commercial scale still, uh, but, uh, you know, people studying in terms of how the presence of graphene could be used to improve the properties of composite materials. So one has to understand that uh, if you look at uh, the, uh, the percentage of either the volume or weight, you can see that it's very small, okay? So this doesn't mean that in a typical composite material, you have the fibers and the resin, okay? That is the, the main constituent of the composite material, right? So if you look at uh, um, airplanes that are made of composite now, what you have is actually different types of fibers in different directions in a polymeric uh, uh, resin, okay? And uh, so this doesn't mean that you are going to take all the uh, fibers and replace it by graphene, right? That's not the case. So you're assuming that uh, we still have actually the standard composition of the composite. But if you start adding actually a small amounts of graphene, you will see that people have shown through experiments that uh, substantial changes in terms of the 
mechanical properties can be achieved. Say for example, 2.5% uh, volume of graphene in polymer actually increases the elastic modulus by almost six times. Okay? And, and similarly, you can see that in various other applications, things like the fracture toughness, uh, elastic modulus and so on is being, uh, you know, like uh, changed in a significant manner uh, due to the addition of, uh, of uh, graphene into the, into the system. And uh, so in terms of applications, you will see that composite materials, uh, you know, today you look at uh, your Embraer planes, you look at the, uh, the, the new Boeing planes, they are all made of, you know, like new generation composites, right? And uh, then also in terms of uh, applications, what are called resonators. These are things that are used actually in uh, electronics, electrical engineering applications, sensors, transistors, and then you know simple applications like uh, paints and coatings and, and so on. So here is uh, basically a very simple resonator, right? And uh, which is built on uh, silicon oxide uh, substrate and, and uh, a resonator like this actually vibrates in the megahertz frequencies. So if you look at typical uh, civil engineering structures, they vibrate in the frequencies about, you know, anywhere between, uh, you know, 1 hertz to 20, 30 hertz. And if you look at about mechanical systems, typically the frequencies can be much larger, they can be 1000 hertz and so on. But in these kind of stru structures actually vibrate in gigahertz. So that actually allows you to use them in very sophisticated communication systems particularly for very high security, where people cannot actually break into the communication system because of the nature of the, uh, the very high frequency, right? And uh, so, so those are some applications, and let me talk about, uh, so how do we model these things? Of course, I don't have to tell you, you are very familiar with the uh, <coughs> different types of models, and uh, you know, those based on uh, sophisticated first principle kind of calculations. Uh, those are very expensive and normally is good for uh, small systems. Uh, but in terms of, you know, like a fairly large system with the focus on applications, uh, people generally focus on actually MD simulations. So what are we trying to do in this uh, work is we are trying to look at actually what is the strength of graphene. So if you start actually taking a graphene sheet and if you start pulling that, right, and when does it fail? So it's sort of, you know, like very similar to if you look at uh, steel uh, uh, rod or something, but extending the same concept into these nanoscale structures. So you all, you know, people who have uh, familiar with mechanical engineering knows that this is a very classical problem that everybody in mechanical engineering, civil engineering use, right? Which is you have a, a material and then you have a crack of a length 2A and then you start pull this one, okay? So you, you apply a load and then what happens is that the load will, you keep on increasing the load and you will see that nothing happens, right? But once the load le reaches a certain value, the crack starts to actually propagate, right? So, so even a material with the crack can take some load actually, okay, right? So under tension, it can take some load. If you take under compression, the crack has no effect because it closes, right? And but under tension, right, the crack has an effect. So still you can apply the load, but after a certain load, actually the cracks start to propagate. And that is what we call the fracture toughness of the material, right? When the crack starts to propagate, up to that we can apply the load. So if you look at that, so the idea is, can we actually extend a concept like that to nanomaterials, right? Say for example, like a, a simple graphene sheet where you will see that we don't have uh, this row of atoms are missing. So it creates a kind of a defect, right? So now if you start pulling this one, 
what is the the strength of a system like this compared to a perfect system okay and how does that varies with this length and so on so our objective is actually to develop some atomistic right models that we can simulate and understand the behavior of structures like this now uh, I also talk here about continuum based models because if you talk to engineers uh, I would say 99% of them are not very familiar with the atomistic modeling things they are more familiar with continuum type of model uh, you know things like the simple beam right and uh, so can we actually take some of these ideas from the atomistic modeling and develop simple continuum models because a continuum model you don't need actually a MD simulator sometimes you can actually take a simple calculator right and then get a result right now the reason we want to do that is that because if you do it into real applications right people are not very interested about accuracy of 1%, 2%. You know, when this building was designed, right? So you are in this building, you have a reinforced concrete uh, frame and everything, right? There is a safety factor of about 2 or 3. So this building is designed, actually, this flow is designed for almost 2 or 3 times <coughs> of the people who would normally occupy, right? So when you have systems that are designed with very high safety factors, right? We are not interested in simulations that are extremely accurate, right? The simulations, very highly accurate simulations are good, right? But in terms of the actual design, because of the safety factors involved, right? We really don't need very high accuracy. So what we try to do is we know that we can be fairly accurate here. But we try to see whether we can actually come up with models that are not computationally very expensive, but still very reasonable. So first I will talk about some atomistic modeling of strength, right, under different situations. And then also we will talk about what really happens in systems like composite materials where you have two material systems interacting, right? So here is one case, okay? So there's a lot of interest in terms of, uh, you know, the interaction between graphene and hydrogen, right? So people who are talking about fuel cells and various other types of applications talk about, you know, like interaction between even in terms of storage of hydrogen right and and then what happens right so in some of these applications uh, for example in fuel cells and so on uh, we are very interested in also in terms of the strength because if you look at in a fuel cell the the biggest uh, uh, issue with respect to uh, 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 reliability is actually the membrane failure okay so so here is a very simple uh, simulation where i have a graphene sheet right and then we have some hydrogen atoms, okay? And then we try to understand actually in the presence of hydrogen, what is the strength of a graphene sheet? And the presence of hydrogen actually changed the hybridization of the, uh, uh, the hydrogen atoms. So here is a MD simulation. We use lamps, okay, uh, to, uh, to simulate this one. And uh, so what you have is here is the pristine sheet. So that means there is no hydrogen, okay? And I have a pristine sheet. I am pulling in one direction, periodic boundary conditions in the other directions. And I pull it until, you know, keep on increasing the strain, right? So you are increasing the load, the strain keep on increasing. So you can see that we have a stress strain relationship like this right mm -hmm. and it increases and then after that the sheet basically collapse 
the bonds breaks okay the you can see a fairly brittle type of failure right the initial bond breaking actually starts somewhere here right if you expand this you can see that it is not as smooth as there <coughs> right and uh, you can see some some of those things there actually right and then you can see a sudden brittle failure now if you start adding hydrogen atoms randomly so you take your uh, graphene sheet and then you randomly distribute hydrogen atoms right uh, one percent ten percent thirty percent and you can see that actually a substantial reduction in terms of the strength yes is there a relation for strain in terms of the missed course? Well, how do we define strain? How do I define the strain? So how do I how I am define the strain is I get the uh, the energy, okay, and the uh, the uh, the derivative of energy actually allows me to get the stress. The strain is defined as I have the. Uh, uh, the uh, the material boundary okay and then I calculate the strain in terms of the displacement of the edge atoms okay the position of that and uh, so you can see that actually uh, the addition of the uh, hydrogen actually reduces the strength uh, substantially for example almost by about uh, uh, 50 percent uh, in the case of uh, uh, Thirty percent uh, hydrogen at the terms. Yeah. yeah. The, the simulations we, we use usually you cannot break a bond in any of these simulations. At least the ones we use. Mm -hmm. So how do you see the bond breaking process there? Is the there's QM involved or there's a different potential function you're using? Uh, there's no different potential function. This is a bond breaking is coming mainly in terms of the cutoff radius. Okay, so, so bond breaking is interpreted like if you take lamps, right? Okay, you can see actually bond breaking in the lamps, right? Because the interaction between certain atoms actually no longer works. Uh, so the potential you use does not have the bond terms, the quadratic bond ter bonding terms. The, this is the repo a, a repo potential, so it has. The yeah. Potential. Yeah. So it's yeah. A, okay. Good. Yeah. It's a different yeah. potential yeah. For, for yeah. function that we use. Yeah. 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 Thanks. So <coughs> now, so that's actually the uh, the MD simulation, okay? And uh, as I said, uh, you know, like we do have uh, uh, the software and everything to do this. Uh, but our idea is actually can we get something similar or closer to this using a, a different model right so here we are using a continuum idea a continuum idea is what is called the Bayley's principle which says that the material fails the failure of a material can be expressed by an equation like this which involves a durability function okay the durability function you can determine actually experimentally and tf is the time to failure okay so it has temperature right and time and then this function is determined experimentally so what we do is we take this function and we assume the durability function can be represented in the using an arrhenius formula right and then uh, this is the classical Arrhenius formula. So we take a variation of this one and we apply this into uh, a graphene system. So essentially we say that this is the Arrhenius formula. We define the, uh, the durability function in this form. So it's very similar to that, right? Uh, <coughs> so U0 is the bond energy which we know the number of bonds right the vibration period sigma t is the the stress at time t right and uh, this is the percentage of the atom concentration this relationship is obtained for a pristine graphene sheet using md simulation we can determine what is a and b right and in fact uh, uh, this equation can be solved analytically 
right? And, and you can get a solution. So uh, that uh, uh, in this equation you have this, uh, uh, this uh, coefficient gamma. That coefficient gamma actually account for the directional dependence of strength because the graphene is an isotropic material. Uh, in this direction it has one strength and that direction it has another strength. So for an arbitrary direction we define. So gamma is given by cos theta. And so we take this one and then we find beta again using uh, uh, curve fitting uh, from uh, MD simulations. So we can actually solve this equation analytically, right? in terms of an error function, right, the solution and we can get actually the time to failure and the stress, the, the failure stress. So you can see that this is my actually uh, pristine uh, uh, graphene solution, okay. And this is the solution I get from 1% uh, H add atoms. MD, right, 10 percent, 20 percent. At different temperature, what is the strength? So you can see that I can, for all practical purposes, right, I can develop a continuum type equation, right, <coughs> using the ideas of continuum mechanics, okay, to simulate actually the behavior of a graphene sheet at different temperatures and to predict actually the strength of that in the presence of hydrogen ad atoms. So here is another one, uh, very similar thing actually, uh, uh, strength for a zigzag sheet, armchair, because the orientation uh, affects the, uh, the, uh, uh, the strength. And this is very interesting. So you can see that the model we develop is 10 to the power 6 times faster than MD. Okay. So, so it's basically an idea from the traditional continuum mechanics extend into these type of structures using some of the knowledge that we have derived through MD simulation. Right. And here is actually another view graph, uh, a contour plot of the variation of strength as a percentage of hydrogen concentration and temperature. This is the uh, plot of stress. And then we actually take again an uh, idea from the uh, quantized fracture mechanics. Okay, this is the crack I showed you. Uh, you can actually calculate the failure strength, okay, uh, in the presence of a crack. Now, the, uh, the previous one I worked actually had no crack. It was a perfect, uh, perfect uh, graphene sheet. Uh, the only difference there was we had hydrogen ad atoms uh, that changed the, uh, uh, the strength uh, properties. Now here I have actually a crack and in the case of a crack I can extend my understanding of uh, coming from continuum mechanics into develop an equation like this which is actually the extension of the standard Griffith formula uh, which is almost 100 years old. And uh, again using a similar things using the Arrhenius type of uh, 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 durability function. Uh, I can solve the, uh, the, the system again, right? And now I can actually get comparisons like this. So you can see I have a, a crack of about 7.3 angstroms. At different temperatures, I can calculate the ultimate, uh, the stress of the graphene sheet. And this is the model, okay, the pristine sheet. Uh, this is the model uh, for the pristine uh, using MD, right? And then when you have a defective one. So you can see that once again a substantial reduction in the strength due to the presence of the defect, uh, which is not unusual. 
And now we are going to look at actually what happens at interfaces. Okay. Uh, so I showed you this uh, uh, practical example where somebody has built a graphene resonator right, on a silicon oxide substrate. So here you have a matrix or a substrate and here you have a graphene sheet. How do these two interact in a mechanical sense right, in terms of strength? So we know that generally graphene actually don't create covalent bonds with other materials okay and uh, so we assume that actually the interactions are primarily through van der Waal forces right and uh, and then we use actually uh, two things we uh, we develop something that is used in composite mechanics in terms of interfaces okay so when people model interfaces people develop these types of cohesive models where you have one material and another material right and the interface is simulated by a simple spring okay and uh, you can find various ways to determine the spring constant sometime experimentally by conducting shear test right and sometime peeling test and so on and uh, but here what we do is actually we develop a model uh, assuming that we have a spring that is characterized by it's a nonlinear spring because it's, it's not linear with respect to the distance right and it is basically governed by a simple van der Waal type of uh, interaction okay and then we can actually determine the the energy stored over the interface right using the expressions and then we can find the cohesive energy right which is the density of the uh, the total energy by using this one right and then we can find actually the cohesive stress which is essentially the derivative of this one so we can work out a fairly nice uh, simple uh, formula we can add actually some kind of uh, impurity into the interface right so if the interface is not perfect right if you have some uh, impurities such as an hydrogen atom or any other atom in the interface we can modify our spring model because once you have this one because the hybridization changes you will see that the the graphene sheet is no longer flat some of the atoms will go out of plane and this distance we can determine from MD and we can actually extend the same idea the the model becomes a little bit difficult because now you essentially have two types of springs one between this and that another one between this and that but still we can work out and then come up with an expression so that's the kind of the simple engineering approach so this is the more sophisticated approach so we take the two systems and we apply we do a full scale uh, MD simulation of this right so you have a graphene sheet we use Erivo to model that we have silicon oxide box right we use Tersoft to model that, right? And then if we have any other terms and so on, like here, we, are, we use simply the Van der Waal, Leonard Jones types uh, interactions. We did, this is very expensive, okay? So we did actually energy calculations at different distances, okay? And once you do the energy calculation at different distances, you can plot it you can take the derivatives then you can calculate cohesive energy and so on yeah. of the yeah and, and the interaction between graphene and, and uh, acidic oxide is from the orbit hmm? or, or is there a no this is the interaction interaction between the, the the graphene and silicon oxide is simple van der Waal forces okay, but from from the atomistic uh, uh, from the atomistic yeah, yeah. Okay. right so this is full, this is, we are not using any approximation. It is important to model the, the fluctuations of the positions of the silica atoms there, or they can be considered really? 
we actually in the model if you go back to the model right if you go back to the model I am assuming actually it is rigid because in the model I have no way of, in the simple continuum model, I have no way of actually accounting for that, right? But in the simulation they are moving. In the MD simulation they are moving, right? In the MD simulation only the bottom is fixed, right? So you have that, uh, so, so we have the interaction defined through Leonard Jones, we can have other terms or we can have no other terms, doesn't matter. We did this simulation for over a different uh, uh, separation lengths and, uh, and then we can calculate all the quantities and then you can see these are the results. Right? So pristine MD, this is the cohesive energy with different separation distance. Okay? So <coughs> You can see as the, uh, sep I mean, you know, it's very hard to, uh, uh, difficult to simulate that part at very small uh, separation distance, right? Yeah. yeah. How each point there is a different, se different simulation in a different separation yeah. distance, and yeah. how do you keep this, that distance fixed? I, I would imagine that they, without any restriction, that they, they no, no, we directly collapse over the surface. No. Now, if you keep it there and then allow it to equilibrate around that distance, it will equilibrate. So, so you, have, you have one sheet like this, you have this one, right? And you keep it at this distance. How? Just leave it there, right? And then leave the, uh, the, the interfacial forces, right? Okay, and then it will equilibrate around that distance. It doesn't collapse. Fix the layer. Fix the layer, top layer. Yeah. Yeah, top yeah, top layer is fixed, right? And so you can see that, you know, like around this side, uh, it's, it's quite challenging calculations actually uh, because the gradients are very large, right? But as the distance is increased, you can see that uh, the system is, uh, is much more stable and smooth, right? And you can see generally uh, in this part, um, it's actually uh, difficult to get some of the simulations from the continuum model, right? But generally at, uh, at distances like this, uh, the model and the, uh, uh, the MD simulation uh, show very good, uh, very reasonable agreement, right? And the, and the results we got from this model uh, we also actually compare with some of the experimentally reported results. People have actually done some simple experiments. Now, the problem is that in the experiments, the, the reported results are so different. Right? The variation between the, uh, the measured uh, uh, cohesive uh, energies between the two surfaces vary from almost like you know, four to five times between different experiments because I think the conditions are very difficult to control, right? It's probably, well, probably not. Right? One idea <coughs> would be the roughness of the civic uh, surface. Yeah. If it's rough, yeah. a roughing can be as perfect as yeah. it yeah. is. Right? Yeah. Right? Yeah. The surface yeah. of uh, silica may not be yeah. as smooth exactly. as... Yeah. Right? So, so it's, it's very difficult to know exactly what's the condition in the experiment, right? But what it says is that what people have reported is in this <coughs> range. Say this one is about 96, this one is 450, right? And, uh, and then you can see that uh, uh, sort of, you know, like uh, from, uh, from our results, uh, we do get sort of, you know, like say in the pristine case, something like about uh, 100 and 170 as the, uh, uh, the limit, right, at this point. So, uh, you know, generally uh, a reasonable uh, uh, yeah. Uh, agreement, yeah. Sorry, can I <coughs> Yeah. When you add hydrogens, yeah. hydrogen that atoms, uh, <coughs> it shifts towards uh, large separations. Yeah. So, I presume that in this uh, air rebo potential, uh, there is a uh, volume for hydrogen. 
Wonderball's interaction parameters for 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 hydrogen. So so one approximation is this is not perfect, right? So the approximation is that uh, the graphene is modeled by Eribo, okay. Uh, silicon oxide is modeled by Tersoff, okay. The, the interactions between the graphene and the silicon <coughs> oxygen atoms are only Van der Waal types, Lennard Jones, okay. The same thing between hydrogen and carbon and hydrogen and silicon and some sort of combination rule between yeah. the yeah. Right. And the so so there is uh, you know I would say a need to improve that right and the the challenge has been you know trying to see that what is the 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 best potential for that so as you can see that uh, what we have done is we have uh, extended some ideas from continuum uh, uh, models which is basically the idea of the Bailey's principle that uh, governs the failure of materials together with the Arrhenius formula uh, to come up with actually continuum type equations uh, that can give fairly reasonable agreement with uh, MD simulations. Uh, we also notice that the addition of hydrogen uh, result in uh, uh, substantial weakness in terms of the mechanical properties even though there may be other advantages and uh, essentially the, the modified continuum kind of uh, concepts that we have shown here uh, they are actually computationally very very cheap right and, uh, and they give you fairly reasonable solutions compared to uh, MD simulations. So uh, thank you very much for your attention. And, uh, so before we break for coffee, maybe there's a couple for uh, a couple of questions. questions yeah. The, 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 the sheet is not perfectly flat, right, okay, because of the hydrogen atom, right, so, but the average distance is fixed. But you don't have oscillations. Uh, we, we do have oscillations, but after about, I think, uh, after how many time steps? After, after a large number of time <coughs> steps, actually, you can see that it settles into a certain configuration with some atoms out of plane. Okay. Right? And how are the experiments? Pardon? How are the experiments performed? The experiments, uh, I am not actually an expert in the experimental one. The experiments were we just uh, looked at from the others, right? <laughs> So, the basically what they, what they have done is like a peeling test. So, so if, you, if you take a silicon substrate, right, and then if you grow a graphene sheet on top of that, right, then you try to sort of, you know, like peel that out, right, and that allows you actually to determine experimentally what is the adhesion. I I I'm 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 I am i am i i am i am i cannot I cannot tell you exactly. I don't remember that actually. Yeah. 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 The, the 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 two papers actually. I I referred to the two papers here, right? And that you will find all the details there. Yeah. I don't think it is in solution. Yeah. Um. Let's. Uh, oh. I can go back to 
the slide twenty four there. Mm -hmm. so. Notice that your model it it, it 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 keeps the same behavior as the MD simulation in most cases. Twenty four. Twenty four. The model has the same form, uh, form uh, the, and same behavior as the MG, but in this case, you can see a difference in the, in the function. The, uh, so, is, is this? I wonder if this is some different process that's going on on the MG, or why is this difference? That, did you look into it? Uh, when you are talking about, you see, the model is always an equation. The model is an equation, yes, yes. so it's relatively smooth. Although I eh? understand that, eh? just most in, in, in almost all the other cases, mm -hmm. the form of the curve of the model follows basically the same thing as the MG. Just in this case, it kind of diverges for us in, in a small uh, in a small. When you say diverges, where? Uh, there's a, a small difference there. That this one. The model is just a uh, it is, it's a straight line. The model is straight line. Yeah, the simulation kind of, uh, there's a bug <coughs> there on the simulation. So this is, does that refer to some specific problem? <coughs> Do you look into it, so what, what creates this bug there? You know, we actually, if I remember, we, we discussed about that, right? And uh, we, were, we were not able to, um, Let me let me go back and think. So we had a crack, right? We had a crack. So we have a crack. So the thing is this, right? I mean, in the case of the model, because it's a continuum, okay, right? Um, it it really doesn't have the issues of what you would see in the MD simulation in terms of. Uh, uh, you know, if you have a MD simulation with, I don't have the uh, the graph here. Uh, uh, if you if you take a MD simulation and then you create a defect there, and then if you start opening it up, right, you would see some very complicated actually patterns in terms how the 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 the, the molecules actually carbon atoms rearrange and so on, right. And those complications don't exist in the model. Okay, the model doesn't account for those things, right? Sure. So, so I think you know, like this is, sit, you know, like it's a, it's a combination of those things. Yeah. yeah. This is we have a fact, right? And then you you have to do many, many, many times these experiments in order to get an average of the behavior. So sometimes the crack will propagate <coughs> like this. The crack will propagate like that um, in, in, the, in the simulation. So it's just like you, uh, lack of statistics is most likely the reason for it. Because uh, I, I don't think that you have, have done hundreds and hundreds of. No, no. Yeah. So we, we, like, say, when I show that point, right, that is about typically an average of about four to five simulations around that. Right? Okay? But they are, they are, they are, there's not such a huge scatter, right? So if I, if I show you these values, the MD simulations, they would be like something like this, right? Well, thank you very much, Nimal. Okay, thank you. Thank you.